Welcome to the Indian Council of World Affairs, India's oldest foreign policy think tank. Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001, when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by an in-house faculty. Very rigorous research of different parts of the world encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India, an Indian perspective on Africa, given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council, we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation, such as renewable energy, uh, climate change and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank and being close to policy, commenting on policy and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age, what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I for many years have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world what I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. It, it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal India Quarterly is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the panel discussion on a gender-sensitive Indian foreign policy, how and why. 
The panel will critically analyze what are the various elements of a gender-sensitive foreign policy and why should India pursue one. It would discuss the Indian approach to the global women peace and security agenda and to what extent has India aligned with these global normative frameworks designed to address the gender dimension of peace and security issues and the role that India can play in its two-year UNSC term. The panel will also discuss the policy frameworks and programs on a gender-sensitive approach on issues surrounding the Indian women abroad. To discuss, deliberate these various facets of gender-sensitive foreign policy, ICW has taken this opportunity of bringing together eminent scholars, academics, and practitioners. The panel today will be chaired by Ambassador Nirupama Menon Rao, former Foreign Secretary of India, and the panelists are Dr. Swarna Rajagopalan, Founder and Managing Trustee, the Prajnaya Trust, Chennai, Dr. Swati Parashar, Director, Gottenberg Center for Globalization and Development, uh, Dr. Swamita Basu, Assistant Professor, Department of International Relations, South Asian University, New Delhi, uh, Dr. Bindu Lakshmi, Associate Professor, uh, Advanced Center for Women's Studies, School of Development Studies, TIS, Mumbai, and Ms. Akansha Kuller, Researcher, Center for Internal and Regional Security, IPCS, New Delhi. Before we begin, some house rules. All speakers are requested to mute themselves when they are not speaking. Questions will be taken during Q&A session. And panelists can ask questions to the speaker through raise hand option. And the questions can also be asked by typing through a chat box. I now request Ambassador Rao to kindly deliver her opening remarks and conduct the proceedings. Ma'am. Thank you, Ankita. And good afternoon to all our very distinguished panel members. It's a privilege to be here at the ICWA seminar on a gender-sensitive Indian foreign policy, why and how. As diplomats today, women or men, we work not only to practice the craft of diplomacy, but we are concerned with matters concerning nat national security, defense, trade and development, apart from the exercise of, of soft, or what is better termed, smart power. This is the life cycle of foreign policy today. But turning to the subject of gender in its traditional form and structure, foreign policy has not dedicated much focus or attention in a coherent way to the impact of its workings on women and children. While as a country, we in India have prioritized diplomatic solutions over di military ones, what is the attention we have given to questions of women, peace and security in policy conceptualization? And has voice been given to those traditionally ignored? We are proud of the contributions of our women to UN peace building, and rightly so but there is still value to be added to the whole terrain of gender sensitivity in our foreign policy, especially as more women are added to our diplomatic strength and they take on Women have a predisposition to diplomacy. It's wired into our genes. Aristophanes' comedy, Mrs. Stratton, 400 BC, is about women from three different cities who, frustrated by the lack of success of men in matters of war and peace, organized themselves to end the Peloponnesian War. The metaphor Aristophanes used for the work of the way to portray women of exceptional diplomatic ability who pull together the strands of society to negotiate peace and weave the fabric of nations. In an ideal world, there would be recognition of these innate qualities of women. But life is far from perfect, and the inescapable reality is that men, as it has been said, have the muscle, the media, and the money to back them up, even as we women weave the fabric of diplomacy on the charkas of life. The union of equality that we need, equality for all, the sharing of strengths of men and women, should be our goal. Foreign policy across a wide swathe of countries has tended to be gender blind. But the scenario is changing. In 2014, 
Sweden became the first country to articulate what it called a feminist foreign policy, saying that such a policy would focus on more representation of women in international politics, equal access to resources for women, and respect for women's rights, that it was centered on gender equality and was an idea based on Joseph Nye's idea of smart power. It was aimed at including half of the population that so far has been almost systematically excluded and forgotten, mainly women. Since then, France, Canada, Mexico, and the Netherlands have been some of the other countries who have come out with their own iterations of the idea. The feminist foreign policy itself adopts an intersectional approach to questions of peace, security, economic well-being, and development from the viewpoint of the vulnerable and underrepresented sections of society. Now, given that nationally, the policy of our government is to further the cause and welfare of our female population, their health, education, livelihoods, and their upward mobility and representation in key national institutions, there should be no barrier in our articulating these basic values in the definition of our global outlook and our foreign policy. For instance, the government could consider appointing a female ambassador for global women's issues, as the Obama administration did with Milan Revere, or create an office for policy planning on women in foreign policy that would look at the whole gamut of women's representation in policy making, ensuring that women's issues inclusion and diversity find a place in our development diplomacy, disaster management, humanitarian assistance, and also in regional cooperation in trade, education, and health, as also ensuring a voice for women in conflict prevention and peacemaking. One of India's founding mothers, as I would call her, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay, so man and woman as comrades of the road, going forward together, a wonderful image to express for this week when we mark International Women's Day. Her worldview was grounded in the realization that the women of India particularly have to provide a global outlook that moves beyond insularity towards a cooperative world order based on decency, peace, and happiness. Of course, the question of being male or female has nothing to do, as Vijay Lakshmi Pandit once said, with the duty of both sexes to take their part in world affairs. Feminists can come from both genders. Feminism, it was said recently, requires us to take a holistic look at power, who exercises power, who is prevented from accessing power, and why. This may be much bigger than gender. It is a question of equality, looking at the historically marginalized and the struggling. We need a systemic lens through which we can tackle such needs. Diplomacy can be gender neutral, but it should not be gender blind. It has to focus on the middle way, getting peace to override war, stressing skillful negotiation, embracing diversity, and eschewing hierarchies and outdated concepts of hegemony. When we say diplomacy should be gender neutral, we mean that it should be about issues that concern human well-being, with women as an indivisible component of this outlook. Women's voices should shape agendas and outcomes in diplomacy, and therefore, women must acquire agency and make themselves more effectively heard on issues particularly of rebuilding and reconstruction of societies torn apart by war and conflict. And as an Afghan woman once said, we, the women, are not responsible for the destruction, but we should be responsible for the reconstruction. Therefore, a gender-sensitive foreign policy is that which focuses on political dialogue for conflict resolution, diplomacy and trade, safety and well-being, that which stresses multilateralism, inclusion and intersectionality, being embedded in civil society institutions and local communities. Women must sit at the table 
participating in decision making that involves the future of our societies. We must prioritize, of course, diplomatic solutions over military ones. For example, have we considered the impact of the use of nuclear weapons on women and children? Does our disaster management outreach and diplomacy and foreign policy have a crucial component concerning the impact on women and children and the benefits to them? Is our policy on climate change sensitive to this category of humans? Our foreign policy as it concerns the developing world should focus on these concerns. Feminism in foreign policy should make us more thoughtful about the ways in which we approach such matters. It should integrate feminine values into policy making in matters of peace and development. It should underscore respect for international law. For instance, have some of the P5 countries considered the impact of their sanctions on their adversaries on women and children? Take the instance of the Iran nuclear sanctions, for example. Often, who is going to feel the impact of these decisions is overlooked. Policymakers should listen to civil society dialogue on these issues. Today, the effect of the year-long COVID-19 pandemic on women should be of special concern, including the issue of domestic violence, the so-called shadow pandemic affecting millions of women worldwide. As Isabel Allende said recently, why are aggression and violence against women not regarded as an infringement of a woman's human rights? The U.S. state of Hawaii recently launched a feminist recovery plan for the pandemic, which centers women at the heart of the policy response. It is called building bridges, not walking on backs. We have to address issues like water, sanitation, hygiene, housing, the gender digital divide, environmental concerns, inequalities in employment, wages, the quality of life. When diplomacy focuses on development, these are issues that should occupy our policy makers because they benefit women and society as a whole. So an intersectional analysis is required in our approach to overcoming the effects of the pandemic. At every cross-section, there stands a woman in need for equal access to opportunities. Vice President Kamala Harris of the U.S. spoke recently of the mass exodus of women from the workforce during the pandemic as a national emergency for America. She said, I quote, the pandemic has created a perfect storm for women workers, unquote. Now, have we in our region assessed the impact of the pandemic on women. And this should be a concern for our policy makers. Where women lead, the responses to the pandemic have been most heartening and impressive. The examples of Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand and Tsai Ing-wen of Taiwan can be cited in this regard. It is said that there are many examples of men ceding ground to women to be appointed to lead in times of crisis letting the women deal with the mess as it were. Look at the case of Theresa May in the UK during Brexit. They call this the glass cliff, women being appointed to positions of responsibility when the chances of failure are the highest. Contrary to expectation, many women in such situations have shown that the glass cliff is no barrier and it can be a weapon to overcome the sister concept of the glass ceiling. Two, involving and engaging women in peace processes should be another concern. How are we to craft peace if half the population is excluded? Our research base for preventing conflict and building peace as an input for policymakers should look at gender equality in this crucial sphere and the role of women. Perhaps this will also help us to challenge the assumption of hard power as the only way to solve conflict. That we can also use the tools of diplomacy, trade, inclusion as a means to bring peace, and never lose sight of the fact that when we think of security, we should think of human security also. We must be alert to the fact that every policy we make affects men and women differentially, 
We must train our minds to look at the gender impact of every policy decision we take. And the same requires that we ensure diversity in the policy and decision-making apparatus, and that we increase consultations with women when making policy so that everyone who is impacted by a decision is able to make their voice heard. Contrary to popular belief, a feminist outlook in foreign policy is not a pacifist foreign policy. It's about having tough conversations in a graceful way. What is important is to balance diplomacy and defense and to use diplomacy as the first line of defense so that decisions we take will lead to more stability. Our decisions should be based on solid data analysis and we should integrate gender equality into the working of our foreign policy. Use the data from research in the field to avoid unintended consequences in the implementation of policy. Another issue of central concern is that of women, peace and security, or the WPS agenda. 20 years after the passage of UN Security Council Resolution 1325, many member states, India included, have not developed a WPS National Action Plan. India is supportive of the agenda and is committed to the resolution itself. But these commitments and talking points require more granularity in translation into action. Perhaps this is a work in progress. We shall see. The issue of armed conflict, the use of force as a weapon affecting the unarmed and marginalized, in which we include women, has a grave impact on lives of non-combatants, and we can ill afford to ignore this factor if we are to ensure conflict prevention and elimination. We have to listen to their voices and to build a national consensus within the country on UNSCR 1325 and understand the true meaning of human security. Strengthening women's representation in key governance institutions and bodies is a part of this effort. This should be a key marker for our democracy. Lastly, there is a felt need for more Indian women to access the field of security studies and international relations and a rise in their numbers in senior executive positions in think tanks in this country, for instance. There are many patriarchal and entrenched barriers to overcome. Women tend to be pigeonholed on the basis of their gender. Old boys will be old boys, although there are many men who are exception to this rule and value diversity and inclusion. A woman security studies scholar recently suggested that a national action plan on UNSCR 1325 by India may strengthen the role and presence of women scholars in peace and security. This is certainly worth further examination and consideration. In conclusion, some years ago I wrote a piece, Have the Women Spoken? Speaking as a South Asian, which I include very much in my Indian identity, I said the following, and I quote, I often wonder what a feminist foreign policy for South Asia would look like. Can we not consider a discourse that speaks of matters beyond war and peace? Now, for instance, peace in the South Asian subcontinent seems to be associated with white flags, surrender, submission, weakness. Do we not think of a South Asian commons, not an arena for mutual jousting where we date each other in blood sport, but a space for maturity of purpose, robust civility, and mutual accommodation? We have built towering babels around ourselves, but we have not cleared a way for the commons. Not much distinguishes Indian and other South Asian women from each other. We share similar genealogies and labor under the same masculine patriarchies. We care similarly about our children, our homes, our environments. We are programmed to be peacemakers, each in our own small way. And we weep similarly for lives lost. We want literacy, empowerment, public health, liberation from hierarchies that keep us confined in spaces, and prevent the full flowering of our talents as capable gifted human beings. 
I said that a feminist foreign policy would embrace the idea of a South Asian commons, that it should speak and act in favor not of ravishing disunities, but of rationalizing unities, of merging capacities to build, to develop, and to link. It would exercise vetoes to block war, not peace. It would emphasize the right to food, the right to health, the right to knowledge and learning, the fundamental right of women to exist, the right to reject the disconnects, the own cliches and mental barriers that divide us. It would weigh the interest of humanitarianism against the interests of power with far greater precision and wisdom. And it would say no to violence against all, but particularly crimes against women and children. It would reject the voices of the far right and the far left. It would feel the true pulse of the unknown, the marginalized, the excluded. It would have a people-centered approach. It would promote business-to-business -business engagement, build the infrastructure for trade, remove non-tariff barriers, facilitate commerce, understand the economics of proximity rather than promoting proximity as a peril. Why sacrifice these benefits at the altar of history? Rather, promote these possibilities as assets that can alter the narrative of the past and realize the prospects of peace that have hitherto, hitherto been so elusive. Feminists, as I said earlier, can come from both genders. The important matter is that we recognize and respect gender equality, the right of women to be heard and to make decisions that affect the peace and security of our homelands, promote participation in public life and expand leadership opportunities for women. The time has just come for us to be as women smarter and braver about what the protection of our interests should be about and how there is no need for others to mansplain a feminist foreign policy. We can speak with greatest authority on what it means. These are a few thoughts. I know that our expert panelists will have a lot to contribute to our discussion this afternoon. I look forward very much to listening to them and to the discussion that follows. Thank you so much to the ICWA once again for giving me this opportunity to participate in this discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Ma'am, you can uh, I invite you to moderate the session now. So we can move okay. on to the first speaker now. All right. So our first speaker, I presume, is Swarna. Am I right, Ankita? So can I request Swarna, who is speaking to us from Chennai, a very distinguished scholar on gender. And uh, I'm sure all of us will greatly enjoy listening to you. I invite you to make your remarks. Thank you, Ambassador Rao. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes, we can hear you clearly. Okay. I, I request the other participants to mute themselves while Swadna speaks. Thank you. So good afternoon, and I want to start by thanking ICWA for inviting me. I want to say inviting me back to be part of this webinar. Um, mm. The last time I was here in October, I figured it was a one-shot deal, but I'm really delighted to be here again, and particularly with this panel. Um, as I sat down to write this talk, I realized that I perhaps knew very little about this topic. You see, I have this handicap from school that I was taught to always read the question paper several times and answer the question asked. So I know something about foreign policy. Traditionally, you know, these are the do foreign policies, the doctrines that diplom diplomats work by, and further, that many presume are an expression of national interest, and some say a function of other factors. I know that in the last 10 years, some of us have written a great deal about feminist foreign policy, especially post Hillary Clinton. And some countries since then, since 2014, have adopted feminist foreign policies. In practice, these feminist foreign policies have meant that uh, they will advocate for the inclusion of women in foreign policy and peace processes. Uh, they will consider human rights absolute and non-negotiable that development and humanitarian aid will become a more important foreign policy instrument. And in both of these, it will be the advancement of women's rights and opportunities that will be prioritized. At first glance to me, a gender-sensitive foreign policy 
sounds like a sweet but deferential act of sensitivity intended to please or appease touchy male decision makers who take feminism as a personal affront. But of course, that can't possibly be true. Therefore, in the short time allocated to me, and you will be grateful for this short time, I will try to understand what a gender-sensitive foreign policy might mean. Um, what are the elements of a gender-sensitive foreign policy? That was question one on my question paper. A gender-sensitive foreign policy, this is just my speculation, calls for a reorientation of our thinking, our style, our structure, and of course our relationships, both internal and outward facing. So let's look at the internal elements first, right? The good news about a gender-sensitive foreign policy, I hope, I think, is that it acknowledges that gender is a spectrum and that it refers to both gender by assignment and gender by identification. Therefore, those who would make, those who would implement, and those in whose name a gender-sensitive foreign policy is made must belong and must be seen to belong to all genders along the spectrum. In other words, the first element of a gender-sensitive foreign policy might be that its universe is more closely aligned with the gender composition of the real world. A gender lens essentially makes it imperative to look so carefully as to see all people as they are and to take cognizance of their perceptions and their needs. So the second element of a gender-sensitive foreign policy must be that gender equality is a cardinal principle of that world, applying first, first to those within the establishment, pay parity, equality of opportunity, a recasting of work that takes into account the double burden that women diplomats carry. This is something that uh, Ambassador Cobra Gadi spoke very eloquently about in the last winter in October, the creation of support systems within the establishment for all marginalized groups, not enough to have a quota that admits people into the system, important to set up the support structures that enable them to succeed. Minority genders, including women, different sexual orientation groups, extending spousal benefits, for example, in support, um, and scheduled castes and tribes, as well as other underrepresented caste groups. A third internal element relates beyond the foreign policy establishment to the country being represented, in our case, India. If we are to have external credibility, then India's politics and policies internally must be gender sensitive too. Some elements of this Yes, we have read down Section 377 of the IPC, but that was only the beginning. The way that the Transgender Act of 2019 was passed without taking on board the concerns of community representatives suggests that the state completely reflects society's discriminatory attitudes towards gender and sexual minorities. They cannot possibly have expertise on their own lives. Since the Jyoti Singh gang rape in 2012, it has become de rigueur to talk for politicians to speak about gender and sexual, sexual and gender-based violence. Statements call for strict action and severe penalties and preventive measures, including the invasion of privacy through CCTVs and restraints on female mobility in the name of protection. Women, like gender and sexual minorities, are infantilized in this discourse, unable to decide for themselves and to determine their best interests. Also, I want to say beyond government, we also have now reduced gender discussions to discussions of violence. Women remain human beings with aspirations, with desire. And uh, we've, we separate the livelihood and violence discussion to a point where it's one or the other. Even as politicians shout themselves hoarse about saving daughters and protecting sisters, they cannot bring themselves to censure their peers for hateful misogynistic speech, or worse, to bar them for being charge-sheeted for violence. 
Our best defenses for this are she could be lying or it is our culture. So the reality is that our failure to create a gender sensitive political culture, leave alone a gender sensitive society completely undermines any aspiration speakers at this seminar might express for a gender sensitive foreign policy. You know, we are, as Indians, um, quick to be offended when other people comment on things happening in India. And one of our counter criticisms is as if you're perfect, as if you are perfectly equal, as if you are perfectly inclusive, as if you are perfectly democratic. But you know, this is the game, not three fingers point back at us as well. We shroud our failings by extending towards our internal international window display the same culture of silence and denial that we did nurture in our homes. This is our family matter. No need to share it with the world. No need at all. So then let's look at outward facing elements. A gender sensitive foreign policy, I presume, includes a full engagement in global debates on gender equality. Now, the hallmark of the UN discourse on gender issues is sustained and systematic consultation with civil society and transnational women's networks. And many researchers, including Dr. Basu, have written about extensively, actually, about the history of this engagement, that uh, transnational women's movements have always been able to approach the UN. And sometimes the UN is facilitates their engagement with their own state establishment. A country with a gender sensitive foreign policy would enter into the same debates with the same spirit of inclusive consultation. In other words, India's foreign policy would be the product of internal debate and open discussion that engaged not just, and I'm grateful to Ambassador Rao for saying this already, not just think tanks with former government servants and but, and more politely, of course, but also academia, civil society, people's movements, and why not, community town halls. If you're making a policy that is going to affect me in rural Dharmapuri, then I deserve to debate about it. A gender-sensitive foreign policy would also mean a deeper commitment to global norms related to human rights and gender equality. Um, for instance, India has ratified the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, with two declarations of contingencies and one reservation. And essentially, these uh, hinge, impinge on culture and pluralism in India. We cannot um, tread on minority rights and implement this. It has not ratified the optional protocol, which allows women to directly approach the CEDAW Committee for Justice. Now, you could read the optional protocol as an, a global reprimand. You're not doing enough and therefore said woman is coming to us. Or you could say this woman and her access to justice is so important to me that I actually don't have an ego, a national ego on this. If she can reach you faster than she can reach me, so be it. I think a gender sensitive foreign policy establishment would open that door with more generosity. Um, I know that Dr. Basu will speak more on 1325, but I will just say that a gender sensitive foreign policy would take 1325 to heart, not just going beyond the national action plan, which may or may not have practical utility in terms of transforming the ways in which we think about conflict and peace, but just to understand what it means to say that women have a right to be part of any conflict resolution process that Women's concerns, the gender concerns should be on board. Impunity should end. I think that's really important. A feminist foreign policy would ensure militaristic solutions to diplomatic problems. I would venture to say that because militarism and militarization adversely impact all genders, a gender sensitive foreign policy would also do the same. Therefore, arms sales, military alliances, and certainly arms races would be regarded less favorably than humanitarian or development aid, for example, the export of vaccines. And trade would also be a more viable and desirable route of foreign policy to, uh, than arms. A gender lens puts human beings at the center of our attention, whether it's a journalist or a scholar or anyone using it. 
an agenda-sensitive foreign policy would do the same. The human and the humane would be at the heart of our policy. Whether with regard to stranded overseas Indians, about whom we now have a record of caring a great deal, or with regard to refugees at our door. And what of border disputes and multiplying arsenals around us and perfidious neighbors, the old school might well ask, you know. Um, it's, I agree, it's easy to be an idealist when you sit at the opposite end from the capital city. And it's also incumbent upon you to be an idealist when you sit at the opposite end from the capital. A gender lens on those very problems might suggest that the costs of not transforming them would outweigh the advantages of maneuvering through them. A gender-sensitive foreign policy would prioritize dialogue, official and non-official, enable confidence-building programs through which different constituencies can interact. And before this uh, discussion, we were talking about the South Asian Symphony, South Asian University, uh, early 90s programs that involve bringing together young people for workshops. Um, a gender-sensitive foreign policy would facilitate functional and technical cooperation in an accelerated way to create the conditions for conflict transformation. Ambassador Rao spoke of Joseph Nye a couple of times. The, the idea that the more interdependence you create, the less likely it is that you will be tempted to go to war, I think is a very powerful one. So why should India pursue a gender-sensitive policy? My answer to this question would be very simply that it is the right thing to do. All genders pay a very high price for aggressive, ultranationalist, self-aggrandizing foreign policies that are expressed just through, se through sexist rhetoric and depend on people playing stereotypical gender roles. No one really benefits, rarely even the states in question. The objective of a gender-sensitive foreign policy would therefore be peace to fair, win-win negotiated solutions to common problems. The quest for a just and equitable peace is a right way to go. But for such a policy orientation to be credible, any country, and India too, will need to undergo a dramatic internal social transformation for that you know, for the credibility. To my mind, that seems less likely today than it did 10 or 20 years ago. In other words, every time we ask a rapist to marry their victim, every time we nominate an abuser to contest elections, every time we vilify women human rights defenders and journalists as seditious, and every time that we use transphobic or homophobic terms to criticize our opponents in public life, we move further away from being credible advocates of a gender-sensitive politics or polity or foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Swadha, for those very incisive remarks. I forgot to mention while introducing Swadna that, uh, that she runs a trust in Chennai and a consultancy, the trust called Pragya Trust, and a consultancy, Chaitanya, which works in education, advocacy, networking. So she's doing wonderful groundwork on the very issues that uh, concern us in our discussion today. Um, Swarna spoke about the fact that agenda-sensitive foreign policy is not being just sweet and deferential. It, uh, it means much more than that. It's a whole spectrum. It belongs to all genders across, uh, across the spectrum that we're talking of. The gender composition of the real world and gender equality should be a cardinal principle in the formulation of our foreign policy. But as a country, if we are to have external credibility, uh, the internal domestic policies are also important because they impinge on the formulations of foreign policy. And... Uh, we have to discard stereotypes. Uh, we have to think of livelihoods for women as being important, the prevention of violence, of course. We have to remove the culture of silence and denial. And also, uh, we need a sustained dialogue within civil society with public participation across the country 
internal debate, civil society and community, town hall involvement, a deeper commitment to human rights, taking the UN resolutions on discrimination and the prevention of violence against women, and uh, conflict resolution to heart, because militarism, militarism affects all genders, violence affects all of us, and putting human beings at the center. And I think that is a cardinal precept, putting human beings at the center, creating that interdependence, which is the right thing to do. Thank you, Swarna, for your remarks. Now I'll invite Dr. Swati Parasha, who is uh, director of the Gothenburg Center for Globalization and Development and associate professor in peace development research at the School of Global Studies at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden uh, to make her remarks. Again, Swati's research engages with the intersections between feminism and post-colonialism. It's focused on violence, peace and development issues in South Asia and East Africa. Uh, she's the author and editor of several books and journal articles. I invite her to make her remarks. Thank you, Swati. Thank you so much, Ambassador Rao. Just a quick thumbs up that I can be heard with technology. Yeah, okay, great. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks very much, uh, uh, Swarna, because I think my presentation nicely flows from where you left, uh, you know, picking up on some of those issues and transposing it on to the, you know, to the genealogy of foreign policy here. But first, uh, Ambassador Rao, thank you for your wonderful insights into the topic as uh, we kicked off this panel. I think you pretty much summed up even before we have, uh, you know, s spoken of things that we care about, but actually it sums up really well what we have gathered here to discuss today. A uh, huge round of uh, appreciation for uh, Ankita and her team for always organizing these events. Uh, and I think after a very long time, I'm actually participating in something on gender and foreign policy. Uh, and uh, obviously, all Swarna, Shomita, we are all familiar faces here. Uh, but I think it would also be nice to hear from skeptics and from those who study foreign policy so that the ideas don't get lost in the conversations among us like-minded people. So I think I would like that kind of a thing as... Um, if the project continues uh, afterwards and, you know, there is some kind of a comprehensive exploration with more more diverse voices. Um, I, just a quick point, because, uh, you know, you, it, so many things already came up. Uh, Ambassador Rao, you talked about the South Asian commons, and I couldn't help smile because, ironically, the perception of hegemonic India is the big barrier in that, that we, are all, we all know, and it is the elephant in the room. And I just remembered that recently at the celebration of uh, 50 years of the uh, liberation war of Bangladesh and at the LSC, uh, you know, how it caused so much outrage because five out of eight panelists were Indians chaired by an Indian and there was one Bangladeshi invited to it. So it was quite uh, quite an outrage among South Asian communities outside the country of how Indians tend to, to, to take up more space when we think about the commons, right? So that's, an, uh, that's a very good point to remember always. Um, so I then stick to the point about uh, what are the elements of gender sensitive Indian foreign policy, why should India pursue a gender sensitive foreign policy? And as I would argue, India has perhaps done that unintentionally, if you look at uh, if you look at the long history, I'm very happy with the framing of it, because uh, I always find that feminist foreign policy, FFP has become a very popular buzzword, uh, almost like a feminist slogan. Um, I've always had similar concerns about uh, WPS as well. And I just would want to foreground that critique uh, based uh, on, on in, in my own location and in my own politics and in the way I see things, perhaps, uh, you know, trans, uh, uh, you know, across two worlds, across, you know, constantly, because I traverse two worlds of living and working in India, but also in Sweden and moving within Western feminist academic life, uh, I'm a little bit careful because I think the way in which these terms get legitimized uh, and, and used, and I think uh, uh, Bina de Costa and I have co-authored a piece on South Asia feminism, uh, South Asian foreign policy and how it has always at various points of time embodied feminist uh, practices. But we often kind of put that aside and we think that this is something new and that we can all kind of, uh, you know, try to emulate. It's happening in Sweden, Norway, Canada. It's so popular and that, uh, you know, we can simply adopt that. I think the 
resources available, the kind of concerns uh, that uh, that governments here in in the West kind of take to uh, these kinds of terminologies uh, is is not always very helpful, I would argue, and it's not exactly embedded in kind of uh, building gender, so, uh, you know, solidarities across borders. Very often, it is about talking about gender equality out there, not so much in these countries themselves. I would just like to start with that caution, and in fact, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy has just. Um, launched uh, an event I think they're doing later this month on, uh, you know, bringing together leading Global South feminists for a discussion on how we can ensure that feminist foreign policy doesn't reflect imperialism and colonial patterns. And I think somewhere this is coming from an understanding that uh, that there there is a degree of discomfort and how it is being presented as the panacea to all the problems uh, and that people out there in those other parts of the world are not thinking through, which, of course, uh, in the remarks today, we have heard that uh, that's not the case. So the history of feminism in India, and uh, in fact, all of South Asia, because you can't talk about feminism in India without South Asia, very rich, textured, even contentious, I would argue. Uh, and we've had both brands. We'd had, uh, we, we, we've had uh, indigenous feminist movements. We've had, uh, you know, those with Western influences. We've had mainstream influences. Uh, but, but the bottom line is that civil society participation has really been strong at both local and national levels. Uh, and in fact, the one thing that we need to always remember that perhaps in South Asia, we use the language of reform movements and women's movements more than feminist movements. Uh, I think we have become uh, uh, used to that vocabulary, but I think it's important to not exclude those who don't explicitly say that we're feminists, but you know, they're doing the groundwork. So it's important to keep those nuances in mind. Uh, as a student of Indian politics, I would respond to the provocation, uh, a gender sensitive Indian foreign policy, why and how, with perhaps saying always, right? We've always, I mean, if, if I start reading, going back into history, I find that so many of the elements of, uh, you know, gender sensitive foreign policy or what is effectively being called feminist, it has been there in shades. But what, and, and what might be its main ingredients? Uh, I'm not saying that it was deliberately thought of as feminist or that there was a uh, gender equality always embedded in it. But I think in the way in which we have imagined ourselves and our relationship to the world, I think that has been reflected. And I think uh, uh, the Indian foreign policy discourse is in some sense this external manifestation of uh, deeply ingrained sense of selfdom derived from its civilizational identity. And that civilizational identity in quotes, we can endlessly debate about that, but I think there's some core principles of it that, that I will come to. So an identity that has shaped foreign policy, I would argue, since the Nehruvian era, reflected in long-term visions and domestic governance priorities. This implies that not only has, uh, in, in some sense, as I say, uh, perhaps unexpectedly or uh, not consciously, gender sensitivity informed certain kinds of diplomatic practices, but we have also pursued uh, ethical, non-muscular, more long-term vision of foreign policy generally, uh, what we call soft power, and of course made several mistakes along the way, for which we hold uh, many of our leaders uh, accountable, and we have, uh, you know, we uh, we believe in. Uh, kind of uh, this kind of public critique that has come into our language. But the fact is that it's much more nuanced than castigating individuals. There there have been mistakes, but it's really interesting when you start mapping uh, in terms of what we have actually done and achieved. Um, so with feminism, of course, being the critical perspective to examine the prevalent power relations, hierarchies, and regimes of truth from the gender lens. Upon a closer study, one could find that Indian foreign policy has uh, at various times embraced the assumptions, ideals, beliefs of feminism uh, in its in its many policies. Uh, gender equality may not have been the goal, but certainly embodying the values of justice, compassion,
nation as an ethical necessity for peace within and outside is in itself an unintended awareness of gendered practices. So with genealogy, I mean, uh, again, going back to Nehru much maligned today, but to understand his very broad vision of national interest, the, uh, the nature and limits of power, constituents of power and what power could be uh, used for. I think he had uh, the broader vision and the more that one reads, one gets an insight into several things that he had imagined. I'm not saying that all of it might have been uh, eventually successful. Two things stand out for me in, in that period of early uh, post-colonial uh, foreign policy. One is the scientific temper that we talk about and uh, we often indulge in I would argue cr criticism without really understanding why it was necessary at that point of time. I think both Mao and uh, Nehru, and you can't talk about India alone because there is the big neighbor, and, and both of them believed that their countries had suffered a century of humiliation from the Europeans. And some of that was because it was often presented that science and technology were cited as biggest differences between the colonized and the oppressors. So I think Nehruvian vision of embracing the scientific temple as uh, in some ways something that could get India out of the political, social, economic, uh, uh, you know, lagging behind the backwardness. It was an important campaign uh, uh, which, which was launched. And I think uh, in some sense we must uh, give credit where it is due that uh, the, the vision to, uh, uh, you know, to achieve socioeconomic parity with the developed world as a foreign policy goal, to, to think about ways in which we could accept, uh, you know, traditions, but with critique, and that we could think about, uh, you know, practices uh, beyond what, uh, what, what was existent, beyond the, uh, you know, customs, modes and traditions that we were used to. So I think science and technology and the scientific temper was important at that point of time. Uh, Non-alignment, again, to me, stands out. Classical feminist approach, if you like, beyond the binary, either this or that. Uh, I think it was quite innovative in imagining the world beyond ideology, power blocks, the arms race, ultimately hegemony, uh, which Ambassador Rao also mentioned. And I think we follow some of that uh, subsequently as well. But as a concept, I think this was a reflection of uh, uh, feminist ideals and theory and practice. It didn't survive in ways imagined but that does not necessarily mean that it was wrong to have even imagined it, right? So um, I think uh, recognizing different shades of thing, not being in absolute judgment is so critical. Uh, so there are perhaps other aspects with those two stand out. And then, of course, uh, comes uh, the Indira Gandhi era, and not going into uh, much details he here. But she did take on the U.S.-China-Pakistan axis during the liberation of uh, Bangladesh, uh, actions driven by definitely humanitarian concerns, although it has always been debated that it was all geopolitical calculations. But if you look at, uh, you know, the archives of that era, I think there was some concern about what was happening to women, and she articulated it in, in different forums. I think returning even uh, the 90,000 prisoner of wars to Pakistan without any kind of serious bargaining or firm commitment in return, I thought that was, uh, you know, that came from a position that perhaps uh, reflected some of those ideals. Uh, I have not been very convinced that she handled the Afghan, in, uh, the invasion of Afghanistan by uh, Russia really well, because Ghaffar Khan kept telling her that uh, this is, uh, you know, he wanted to talk to her and to stop this. And I think Jain Dixit's memoir which I'm kind of reading right now give a different story. So I'm not sure that was well handled. In fact, you could say that the most muscular policies we practiced or perhaps adopted in foreign policy was when she was in power, right? So the interlude period very quickly uh, between Indira Gandhi to now, uh, marked by ambiguity and always looking for a middle path instead of balancing or bandwagoning like the realists, right? Uh, we had already lost the notional patron in uh, with the end of the Cold War. Um, you know, then we entered into a new phase of conflict with Pakistan. But I think the entire... Uh, <laughs> Look East policy that we had where we talked about, you know, our cultural civilizational links that we tried to revive under uh, Prime Minister Rao. Uh, and uh, also the Asia rebalance of pivot to Asia. I found I found that really interesting under President Obama when it was launched. And, you know, there was this big debate that uh, India was to be the linchpin in the scheme of things. And 
you know, there was repeated, uh, you know, media reports that India was being wooed, that, you know, we had a role there. But I think uh, we, we stood our ground. And I think uh, I quote Ambassador Rao here, who stated at that point of time uh, that, uh, you know, the, the historical links to the Asia Pacific were more than geopolitic or geoeconomic. This was a geo civilizational paradigm, a creative space with revolving doors where civilizations coalesced and did not clash. We see that as a rough guide to our future. So in some sense, uh, that, that continues, reflects in, in some of the things that we have achieved and think about. Uh, right now, the, the Modi era, despite all the hype, non-alignment in some sense is still alive. We've been very careful. We have uh, we have to balance these two big powers. Uh, and, and of course, we are watching a lot of uh, interesting developments with the Quad, how we deal with, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, Germany, Japan, US, the big powers that will come around, I think is interesting. Not to mention the performative vaccine diplomacy playing out. Uh, I would say a lot, of it, a lot of it is performance, but I think uh, we are also exercising a kind of soft power by reaching out to Bhutan, Guyana, Jamaica, I mean, the smaller states. And I think that says something about the continuity that we would witness in foreign policy over a period of time. So I think deep down, I, I want to move beyond the uh, women and, uh, you know, the, the uh, Swarna, you've addressed it, and I think others will as well, uh, how we need to prioritize it. But our foreign policy reflects a kind of a gendered language. Uh, and I think an understanding that national interests are best served by cumulative interests of the community of nations from global, regional, near neighborhoods. We have tried, not very successfully, at times, but I think somewhere we have survived uh, because we have this idea that this very narrow, self-serving, uh, self-aggrandizing goals are not, not very beneficial. They only lead to outright war. And we've had a very interesting understanding of power where we have uh, not only tried to stay away from the bipolar context, but we've also uh, kind of, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a tough balance for India being in this region with China, with the US, with big powers. I think we've tried to do that. We may have created perceptions about our own hegemonic status and that's something that we can watch out for. Finally, I would say that, um, you know, there'll be, as I said, much more talk about uh, representation and gender equality in, in foreign policy circles, whether our cabinet committee on security, uh, foreign services, uh, more qualified colleagues here will comment on how uh, much remains to be done uh, and how much we have to prioritize. Uh, but as feminists, we are also careful that we, we would not argue that putting women in places of power means a more peaceful world will emerge. That is something that has been critiqued and none of us would say that. Nevertheless, that is not an argument to not include women in decision making uh, and, and to or perhaps it's never enough to emphasize that uh, the women have these, bring these unique experiences uh, and uh, there's an argument to be made about why we need to see more women uh, and their shades of uniqueness. We saw that with Sushma Swaraj, uh, you know, in times when things were going really hawkish. But I think as foreign minister, she showed exemplary care and compassion. So it's it's not a stereotype that you bring in women and you're going to make peace a peaceful world. But it's important to talk about the differences, the different approaches that women will bring and why that gender equality is very necessary. Uh, and, and finally, I think I want to just end with the idea that we have to think about the South Asia uh, comments that uh, Ambassador Rao also talk about, talked about. Uh, I think the biggest, uh, uh, you know, the biggest uh, problem, the barrier to this is how we think of it, uh, you know, how Indian hegemony is perceived, how we occupy spaces. I go to a number of South Asian conferences or I look at, there's, there's a book that has just come out on colonialism in South Asia that caught my eye. It's a Outlet handbook. All contributors are from India. It's colonialism in South Asia. There is all, not only are contributors from India, everything is to do with India. And I think this is being widely noticed in the courses that are being taught in universities abroad, including in India. I was in CSDS as a visiting fellow in 2016, and we had a course on South Asia. And barring um, Alama Iqbal, we did not teach anything from anywhere in the neighborhood. So I applaud you, Ambassador Rao, for doing this work, and I just hope it takes off in a big way. So with this, I uh, close here and look forward to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Swati. Thank you for bringing this very uh, interesting definition of how the feminist outlook 
that basically informs our foreign policy and provides an undercurrent, perhaps something we involuntarily absorbed and never knew all along. That's a very interesting takeaway from, uh, from your very textured, textured comments uh, on the subject. And, uh, uh, and I hope we can discuss this further in the time available to us after the speakers have finished making their presentation. So I'd like to now move to our next speaker, Dr. Somita Basu. Uh, she is the Assistant Professor in International Relations at the South Asian University in New Delhi. We were just talking of the South Asian Commons, and I think the South Asian University is a, is a wonderful enterprise uh, endeavor to essentially express uh, what Lakshman Kadirgavar would say along, uh, all along, that South Asia is an integer here. That we cannot separate um, the one from the many in, in that context. So I'll invite Somita to make her comments now. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Rao, and thank you also to ICWA and Ankita for organizing this panel discussion. Um, a very good afternoon to all of you. We already have a lot of valuable insights on the table, and um, I'm happy to take this discussion forward. Uh, my brief uh, is to focus on the Women, Peace, and Security agenda, and uh, specifically India's engagement with the UN Security Council. Now, there are a few points I would uh, like to set out as a background to my remarks on the topic. To begin with, um, we are discussing uh, gender-sensitive foreign policy in an international context that is increasingly mindful that gender matters in international affairs, uh, in words if not always in deeds. And this is certainly evident in the Security Council, which has 10 resolutions on women and peace and security. The fulcrum of what's called the WPS agenda holds regular open meetings on the theme. And over the years, we've seen the establishment of uh, national action plans uh, for the implementation of these resolutions by 86 member states. So, you know, for India, it makes sense to talk gender in this uh, international scenario. Uh, next, I'd like to note that uh, one can be gender sensitive uh, without necessarily being feminist. And we've had some conversation about this already. Um, but I'll, I'll take the example from gender related scholarship in international relations, my discipline. So scholars may recognize gender as a variable. And so, you know, in their research, they may count women, men and others. But they may not be driven by the transformative dimension of feminist thinking. So as we discuss gender sensitive foreign policy today, it would be useful to reflect on what India can or hopes to get out of such a foreign policy. And my fellow panelists have already placed a number of ideas on the table. Now, whether you wish to call it feminist or, you know, if you know, if you prefer to use another term for it, but the normative aspect of this becomes quite important. Otherwise, we are just counting women in the process for, for what it's worth, and it, that's worth something as well. And finally, at an international forum, and I come here to this because I come to this because of uh, uh, my focus on the Security Council, um, it is a matter of uh, finding balance between national interest and international norms. While we associate women, peace and security, uh, the sort of WPS agenda and women's rights with international norms and legal frameworks, evidence suggests that these are also in the interests of states. Research by Valerie Hudson and her team has linked women's status with the security and stability of a country. Um, the 2015 Global Study on 1325, led by Radhika Kumaraswamy, cited research which has shown that, and this is a quotation, uh, women's participation increases the probability of a peace agreement lasting at least two years by 20%, and by 35%, the probability of a peace agreement lasting 15 years, end quote. So again, it makes sense to take the gender dimension seriously for member states committed to international peace and security. At the same time, however, there may be a disjuncture between what may be identified as national interest and gender sensitive or feminist policies. 
We see this in the case of both Sweden and France, wherein their arms exports are at odds with their feminist foreign policy and feminist international assistance policy, respectively. There's a broader point here of militarization uh, that does not square with the pacifist trends of feminism. But there's also the fact that they are selling arms to countries involved in deadly conflicts that have wreaked havoc on civilian lives and have gendered implications. So the question is, how do we square these two competing sets of interests? Um, and this relates to issues uh, raised by Dr. Rajagopalan as well. Now, against this backdrop, I will now move on to discuss WPS and the Security Council more specifically. At my last presentation at uh, an ICWA, uh, ICWA webinar on a similar subject, I had discussed the gender dimensions of the Security Council, and I won't rehash those points here. But I will draw on the research I did for that paper, a part of which was to study the statements that India has made at the Security Council at WPS-related open meetings um, over the last 20 years. Now, there have been uh, some references to WPS. Um, just to say very quickly that this started with the adoption of the passage of Resolution 1325 in October 2000. It had... Um, it talked about um, recognizing and encouraging participation of uh, women in conflict prevention, peace negotiation, and it also talked about protection of women from um, uh, conflict-related sexual violence. Uh, and as I also said earlier, this it has really, and probably became a pattern from the presentations earlier, that it's really taken off uh, in uh, internationally again, in words, if not always uh, in deeds. And this is a good time also to add that some commentators have highlighted the links between feminist foreign policy and WPS. A 2014 article published in Foreign Policy described uh, feminist foreign policy as, a, and I quote, perspective that flows from Resolution 1325, end quote. I'll now outline three points relating to India's engagement with WPS at the Security Council, First, the record so far, second, a possible way forward, and third, issues that would need to be addressed as India goes ahead with this approach. Now, on the first point, it's uh, fairly well established that India's stance on WPS has been outward-oriented, which is that its interests have focused on the agenda's broader normative orientation and implementation of the resolutions in situations that are identified as threats to international peace and security. Uh, it has co-sponsored uh, three WPS resolutions during the period 2009-2010, uh, incidentally just prior to beginning its seventh term as an elected council member in January 2011. These are resolutions 1888, 1889, and 1960. Uh, during its 2011-2012 term, it served twice as the president of the council and when it held the second presidency in November 2012, India convened an open meeting on WPS, which is notable because, uh, you know, the first meeting was on peacekeeping, which, of course, is something that India has been doing for a while. And the second theme that it chose to focus on uh, was WPS. Uh, in its own uh, statements at such meetings, India has touched upon several aspects of the agenda, but its more substantive contributions have been in relation to UN peace operations, uh, the deployment of the female form police unit as part of the UN uh, mission in Liberia, which is, of course, well known. Uh, but India has also demonstrated interest in the protection pillar. Now, again, the focus on peacekeeping is no surprise because as one of the highest troop contributors to UN peace operations, it has positioned itself as a key stakeholder in this arena. And the success of the female peacekeepers in Liberia and the international attention that their efforts have garnered have been highlighted at numerous statements made at the Security Council by India and other member states. And notably, and so just now moving on to the protection pillar, one of the key reasons given for the, this deployment was to curb sexual exploitation and abuse of women in conflict regions. And more recently, India has made a donation of approximately 300,000 US dollars to the UN Department of Field Support for the Pipeline to Peacekeeping Command Program, uh, highlighting specifically issues of conduct and discipline. 
Now, zooming out again, it would be safe to say that India's position on WPS has evolved and changed over the last 20 years, certainly with regard to women and peacekeeping. The second example that I would bring here relates to India's shifting stance on the coming together of the WPS and the countering terrorism agendas. Uh, India cautioned against this in 2015, but by 2018, it was calling for the Council's sanctions committees to, within quotes, address the issue of proactively listing terrorist individuals and entities involved in sexual and gender-based violence in armed conflict. So, uh, peacekeeping and terrorism are the two main thematic issues that stood out to me. And I'll focus on these as I move on to the second point about moving forward in this current term. Uh, we can expect peacekeeping to remain central to this uh, discussion. Uh, at the recent ICWA-USI webinar on India and UN peace operations, more than one speaker brought up issues relating to women's participation and protection. Um, in that sense, I suppose it's been mainstreamed to some extent in the Indian approach. I would add here, based on MEA statements, that the FFPU's work in Liberia was clearly aimed to prevent re recurrence of conflict as well. So India's stated commitments to mainstreaming gender in peace operations can be potentially strengthened through further attention to the prevention pillar of the WPS agenda. And with terrorism identified as a major area of concern, and with India chairing two sanctions committees this year and poised to chair the counterterrorism committee in 2022, there may well be further developments with regard to WPS here as well. I should add, though, that feminist scholars have advised caution when bringing together the WPS and counterterrorism agenda, as it may, among others, increase vulnerabilities of women in some cases. Now, Dr. Parashar, who studies terrorism, I'm sure can add more to this uh, in the question and answer session. On my part, as I conclude, I'll just highlight two issues that India would need to consider as it continues with this uh, engagement with WPS at the Council. And again, these have come up in, in some form or another, so please feel free to cut me off if uh, I go beyond the time limit. Um, first is that India's attention to gender-sensitive foreign policy in the security sector would also draw attention to domestic issues. Now, at the Security Council, domestic references by India have mainly highlighted uh, women's political participation in the country, especially at the panchayat level. A statement made last year noted, for instance, India's, and I quote here again, experience of mainstreaming women's leadership and political participation will continue to inspire our actions, end quote. Uh, but India has generally refrained from drawing attention to regional concerns of violence within the country at, the, at these WPS open meetings. Some exceptions here are references to cross-border terrorism and its impact on women. And a 2019 statement that recalled, within quotes, appalling atrocities perpetuated with impunity against women by the armed forces of a state, uh, end quote. This was in relation to the 1971 Bangladesh war. Now, I'm uh, ambivalent about a national action plan, but all I would say in this regard, and uh, again, as I said, it, this has already been discussed, but there needs to be greater attention to gender and security issues within the country for us to legitimately talk about gender uh, internationally as well. Secondly, and this is my concluding point, any discussion uh, on India and the Security Council really gets caught up in the debates around the permanent seat. We don't seem to move beyond that very much. And while that is important, such charter changes are extremely challenging, and I'm happy to discuss this further in the Q&A. Um, what I would suggest that India should instead focus more energies into having a greater voice in decision making as it has sought to do in relation to peace operations and successfully so to, to, to a large extent as, uh, you know, an occasional elected uh, member. Uh, and greater, in this regard, greater engagement with gender um, aspects of WPS uh, is both timely and sensible. Um, I have more to say on this international aspect, uh, the kind of challenges that come up, for instance, Brazil's experiment with peace operations in Haiti, which was hugely ex um, successful in Haiti, but it didn't 
give Brazil as much uh, mileage as it was hoping. This is in Transcend um, uh, de Paula's work. So again, India would need to kind of balance out these different aspects as it moves forward with its gender sensitive foreign policy. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sumita. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, these, this, these discussion points on women in peace and security and uh, the way forward for India and the manner in which the Indian approach has also been evolving. I think you presented it in a very nuanced fashion. Uh, you know, the threats to international peace and security, uh, our peace uh, building operations, the protection pillar, and now possibly a prevention pillar also. So uh, this is something I think that merits uh, in-depth discussion. But thank you once again for making uh, those points. In the interest of time, I think we'll have to now uh, go on to our next speaker, Bindu Lakshmi Patada, Associate Professor at the Advanced Center for Women's Studies at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. Her research interests are in the area of gender studies, labor, transnational migration, health, and disability. She has years of experience in doing ethnographic field work in the UAE and understanding the transnational mobility of Indian migrant women, domestic workers. I invite her to make her remarks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Ravu. I hope uh, I'm audible. Am I audible to all of you? Um, you are. I, uh, please, all please right. go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this, uh, you know, this uh, very uh, extremely excellent panel. And uh, you know, the speakers before me has uh, eloquently spoke about uh, gender sensitive foreign policy and uh, uh, the feminist perspectives on uh, foreign policy. And let me uh, begin with, I am not an expert in international relations, uh, neither am an expert in foreign policy. However, I feel that uh, an important aspect of thinking about and working on uh, uh, gen gender sensitive foreign, foreign, foreign policy, we won't be able to you know, uh, take into account without looking at a small segment of migrant workers who are contributing immensely to the nation's development. So uh, last uh, you know, couple of years, from since 2006 onwards, I've been actively writing and engaging with uh, transnational migration, particularly looking at the lives of migrant domestic workers who are moving from India. And my interest area is primarily at this point is Middle East, and I have done ethnographic work in uh, United Arab Emirates, primarily looking at two Emirates, Dubai and Sharjah. So I'm only trying to bring in some point here, perhaps that will generate more discussions as we go along. Uh, so how do the brief to me uh, is to think about how do we look at uh, and how, how can we talk about uh, uh, policy perspective for migrant domestic workers? So let me begin with the, what is gender sensitive for foreign policy when we talk about what is the point of departure to begin the conversation around foreign policy? Why do we need a gender sensitive foreign policy to bring in? And I know that the speakers, that uh, you know, the uh, panelists have already touched upon many of these aspects and I'm not going into the details of all of that. However, let me begin with uh, perhaps a story. I think I'm um, you know, more of a storyteller than trained as an ethnographer, I would be able to communicate that. Since 2006, as I said, I have been uh, you know, researching on transnational migrant domestic workers. I met uh, Suja. Suja is a domestic worker whom I met in 2007 in Dubai. She was uh, working in uh, uh, one of the Indian households by the time I, uh, the time I met her. She was working as a living domestic worker. And uh, she had a very long and complicated stories of migration trajectory. Entered in an abusive relationship, abusive marriage, uh, in, in fact, in an early marriage uh, uh, at a very young age. She finally mustered the courage to leave the abusive relationship. And when she got an opportunity to uh, travel abroad, that was through a network of agents, uh, to work as a domestic worker. She left her infant child. Uh, with her mother. Uh, that is the story of many domestic workers whom I met. They're leaving their children back home and then they are working for someone else uh, in somebody else's private home. 
Uh, so, in order to facilitate this journey, Sujaya did not have any money to go with. She mortgaged her mother had a little a tiny home. So, she decided to mortgage this tiny home of her mother and to get some money to uh, facilitate her travel so that she can pay the age and adequate uh, uh, no, the money for, to facilitate the travel. So, the working situation, when, when, we, when she reached uh, Dubai, the working condition was not favorable to her. She had gone through constant harassment and humiliation uh, that was uh, no, that has been for a uh, long period of time. And finally, she decided to escape from that house. So while escaping, so one of the, uh, the complex, uh, complexities of uh, domestic work, particularly when you work in, a somebody, work in somebody's private home and the work, work relationship, your passport is confiscated by the employer. And Suja did not have her passport with her. And she ran away from their household. And, but however, there is a demanding labor market for her. So she decided uh, to run away without her pass passport, without any document with her. However, she managed to get another job. And that is the juncture at which I met uh, Suja. I've been having long conversation along with, uh, you know, this was part of my ethnography fieldwork where I met uh, many women trying to collect their loyal life stories, the situation through which they have traveled, the negotiations they made with uh, uh, state officials, with uh, different rackets, uh, networks. So this is what I was trying to look at. So this juncture, when I met her, I was trying to ask her, uh, don't, you, uh, don't you feel like going home? So she said she doesn't have a document. And this is the time in 2007, UAE declared general amnesty. So that is the time, you know, so uh, if you have, if you don't have document, that also the system, the state facilitate safe travel for migrants. However, Suja decided not to travel. She said, if I get, if I go through ex, you know, exit pass, if I go through amnesty, I won't be able to come back. I won't be able to come back to this place and work. And uh, that going, returning home, Without the possibility to come back, is not a pos that is not a possibility in front of her. She said that she need to stay back. She need to stay back uh, to pay her debt. She need to make uh, enough uh, money for her living and also for her aspiration in order to piece together a shattered life that has been, she has been going through. So the story of uh, Suja is not isolated. I have met many women like that. Many of them would, in official terminology, they could be absconders, they could be illegal migrants. The, however, I would uh, use the word illegal migrants with a little caution because I think that this is a system that perpetuates illegality rather than the, you know, calling migrants and labeling them as the illegal migrants. So uh, when we uh, talk about uh, Suja's condition, can I call Suja a vulnerable uh, a victim of mobility regime, or uh, is she a survivor who navigates through the rough waters of migration trajectory? And uh, why am I interested in Suja's stories, or like many other women whom I met who have traveled across through different uh, channels of migration? Border crossing was not very easy for them. Some of them could manage to go through the so-called proper channel. Some of them have to pay the uh, agent, there are you know, uh, paying uh, bribe to the officials and different channels they took and uh, travel. So, in 2007, government of India brought a legislation. Uh, uh, it is an age restriction of 30 years for if uh, you know, women uh, uh, agree to you know, decide to travel abroad. So this 30 years, uh, it sounds like a, a magic number, 30 years, one needs to be uh, attain 30 years in order to travel if you have to go with uh, an immigration clearance required in your passport. And many migrant domestic workers, like many other unskilled uh, workers, would come under this category easier, immigration clearance required. Uh, irrespective of the nature and uh, you know, the category of their employment and also irrespective of their educational opportunity because women are uh, unskilled workers and domestic workers for some particular reason has become part of the, the whole ambit of unskilled labor. So I'm trying to look at what is the context of an age ban that is coming for women's work. So I uh, find it as symbolic regulation. This is a symbolic regulation under the garb of protectionism. Here, uh, you know, you, we assume that it is protecting women, but it is doing quite the contrary. It does not protect migrant women domestic workers. Rather, making their uh, 
you know, life and making their vulnerable situation much more precarious. And that precarity is something that is created through regulations. That is something which we need to look at. It is important to find newer strategies to combat violence against women. So I was trying to, over a period of time, I was trying to figure out what is the history of this age when, how did it come through? So it is often, uh, you know, seems to suggest that uh, there is a lot of uh, violence happens against women. The, you know, women enter into sexual trafficking. There are traffickers, they are taking unscrupulous victims uh, to, you know, uh, trafficking them for uh, sexual, uh, you know, uh, uh, slavery, etc. So this discourse is so dominant that has been you know, uh, the, the, the dominant and overpowering under the garb of uh, protectionism. And it is doing quite contrary to the lives of these women. So what do they do? They Either they have to wage, wait under the, under, the, under the age of 30 or need to find a way to circumvent the migration. And many of them are doing that. They have to find uh, ways to find uh, forging the document, trying to figure out other ways to travel. Uh, for example, uh, this conflation of trafficking with migration, this is considering women uh, migrant workers as, uh, you know, they are always under the receiving end of violence. So there is, uh, what we would see in this narrative would be also trying to see women migrant workers as only sexualized gendered bodies and violent victims of uh, exploitation. We don't see, we don't necessarily see them and acknowledging as women as workers and they have a right and you know, they, have, they have rightful entitlement to travel and they have a right, rightful entitlement to uh, you know, mobility. And I also want to add here, when I'm trying to talk about migration, I don't want to say that migration is only for livelihood. What if uh, you know, women want to desire to go? Their desire has to be uh, having a say when we, they are trying to talk about it is not only that when somebody is some, uh, trying to migrate it is you have to give a justifiable reason for that there are different conditions there are conditions of exploitation at home domestic violence caste violence perpetrated uh, at place many of them uh, allowing women to enter into the larger world of that globalized workforce in order to you know uh, in order to aspire newer thing in life so something uh, one need to look at. Sorna already talked about, and let me re-emphasize this, it is an aggressive, hyper-masculine, ultra-national foreign policy that will not help us to transform into an inclusive, gender-sensitive uh, you know, uh, understanding of uh, foreign policy. And particularly, to look at the lives of women who are uh, you know, under, when we're talking about women, I don't want to talk about women as a homogeneous category. I'm talking about the layered hierarchy here. And many domestic workers, many women domestic workers, they are coming from much, much impoverished condition. And there are various push factors that is uh, pushing them to figure out ways to travel, you know, navigate across, and finding new ways to work in a globalized market. So uh, when we talked about a gender sensitive policy, foreign policy, that should begin with an articulation of gender. That is something of a, as a normative common sense. However, is it uh, adding gender as an addendum is not enough. And uh, the previous speakers in fact talked about it in much length. So incorporation of gender into policy framework as mere addendum is not going to work. It has to be incorporated with its subtleties. When, when I say that, I also wanted to think about it is something intersectional feminist brought in. We need to look at the numerous intersections of gendered articulation. So, and, the, and when I talk about, when I try to imagine a feminist foreign policy, uh, this uh, lies on that intersectional possibilities. So a gender sensitive foreign policy also demands an overhauling of state institutional nexus that built on patriarchal power relations. And I can see very clearly the history and emergence and ideology of this uh, age ban comes from this uh, no, uh, the larger context of patriarchal power structure. So I do consider protectionism, protectionism is emerging from this ideology of patriarchy, where we see that uh, you know, there is uh, this assumption that women symbolizes the nation and we need to protect our women. And rather, we don't th think about, we don't articulate structural inequalities. It is embedded in those power structure. 
state civil society collaboration with social movements is one of the ways in which we need to articulate a strong uh, feminist foreign policy but at the same time we also need to take into account of the rich history of uh, feminist movements which we have when we again when we say uh, the rich history of feminist movement we need to take account of that taking knowledge from these diverse movements in order to understand local needs and specificities we need to build our policy framework based on relational ethics and uh, when i'm trying to think about uh, uh, how do we combat gender based violence can we think about as an individual or rather there should be uh, when we think about a feminist care ethics can we articulate a relational care ethics a relational ethics in order to articulate in order to combat gender violence so then it doesn't necessarily go with the hyper masculinist articulation of protectionism it has to come from it has to come from a, uh, a, an ethics of care an ethics a relational ethics that to be done that is trying to learn from each other so most importantly we need to move away from a moral framework that is trying to see women as sexualized gendered bodies let me uh, to conclude let me try to point out a couple of things <coughs> in order to articulate um, uh, women's uh, no uh, Uh, in order to understand uh, a gender sensitive uh, foreign policy or imagining a feminist uh, foreign policy we need to have even in academic uh, engagement we need to have a uh, overhaul of the our methodological articulation currently when we try to think about migration migration is always or um, articulated with methodological nationalism where you see that border is the entity the state is the entity and you see migrants as somebody who is crossing the state but in the context of transnational migration it is important for us to reimagine the articulation of methodological nationalism and to think about life stories and pay attention to the stories of migrants and i think uh, you know lot of ethnography studies and feminist scholarship happening in migration is leading towards that trying to think about uh, listening to stories that is coming from the local context and in that sense it is also helping us to reimagine uh, going from the macro going from micro to understand the, the macro perspective instead of uh, looking at a top down approach because definitely an age ban came from uh, somewhere above here we need to think about and include all stakeholders in fact when sorna talked about uh, the uh, transgender policy that is being we can see number of other policy framework which is coming from without necessarily including the stakeholders into it we don't take into account it's also to do with uh, where do you see the knowledge binaries whom do you consider as the person who is the expert and we don't necessarily try to take all stakeholders and it must include it has there should be much more participatory approach in order to include more stakeholders and all stakeholders particularly those who are at the margins that is the only way we can imagine a gender sensitive foreign policy i think i'll stop here and uh, thank you for your time and i am again i'm saying not an expert in international relations i'm trying to bring in uh, this uh, stories that has been uh, i've been you uh, know collecting over a period of time the life stories of women and these are fascinating these are really fascinating stories to see how they navigate how do they see themselves as absconders navigating through legality and how do they lie between when we try to see a migration as uh, the, the legal and illegal it doesn't necessarily lie in that binary there are mar- mar- multiple gray areas in between where you would see that undocumented workers in fact uh, navigate through that and often state also benefit from these lives and work of these women and let us acknowledge where the acknowledgement lies particularly these lives and this you know the work of these women who are contributing in different ways to the the nation's development and i'll stop here thank you very much for your time thank you thank you so much uh, dr bindu lakshmi and uh, for uh, providing that micro perspective that should inform our macro perspectives and the need for sensitivity in using terms like illegal migrants confusing trafficking with migration and uh, not really understanding what the aspirations of women at the grassroots are when they seek avenues for migration thank you so much for your comments
Uh, now we come to the last panelist, uh, but not the least, uh, in our discussion this afternoon. Uh, Ms. Akansha Kuller, she's a researcher at the Center for Internal and Regional Security at the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies in Delhi. Her work focuses on women, peace and security agenda, and how I, identifying how national, regional, and international organizations contribute in shaping uh, contributed in shaping UN Security Council Resolution 1325. I invite Akansha to make her remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Rao, for the introduction. Um, I would also like to begin by thanking ICWA for organizing this discussion on such an important topic. Um, now, a lot has already been discussed, uh, so I will simply try to break down the issue a bit further, uh, not complexly. So um, I, as a researcher and as a feminist, strongly believe that the reasons as to why India should pursue a gender-sensitive foreign policy are many. But what thrills me is the fact that people have begun asking this question today and at a time when India's foreign policy is already envisioning to widen its sphere of influence and is move, moving towards making a stronger commitment towards the goal of women empowerment. For instance, India, uh, in a significant victory, recently became a member of the United Nations Commission on, uh, on the Status of Women. India also became a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council for the eighth time. And in its opening speech, Ambassador Tirumurthy, the permanent representative of India to the UN, clearly stated that peace building and peacekeeping, along with women's inclusion, will receive India's attention. It is also important to note here that previously, India has been actively participating in the UNSC open debates on WPS, which is a cross-cutting issue having multi-sectoral dimensions. India has also co-sponsored Resolution 1889, which forms an integral part of the WPS agenda and is focused on a post-conflict rebuilding, calling for the development of uh, indicators to measure the implementation of UNSCR 1325 both within the UN system and by member states. However, to ensure that India's strong rhetorical commitments towards gender equality and women's participation in peace and security matters are being translated into action, India should consider adopting a feminist foreign policy framework, thus making much more concrete efforts to mainstream gender at the policy level. But what is a feminist foreign policy anyway? So a feminist foreign policy approach focused, is focused on protecting the needs of marginalized and female groupings by critically reflecting upon international power structures and by putting human security issues at the heart of discussions. Therefore, apart from drawing a direct correlation between India's words and actions, a FFP could also offer India with an opportunity to create a conducive environment for peace eliminate domestic barriers against women, and assist in building stronger bilateral relationships. Now, these are some of the main points that I will be dwelling upon during my presentation. But before proceeding any further, I feel it is very important to understand India's foreign policy approach so far to, uh, in order to assess why India should take up a feminist foreign policy approach. So as for any nation, the principal priority in India's foreign policy play has been ensuring the maintenance as well as protection of its national security interest. But in doing so, India has adopted a rather narrow and a traditional view of uh, security, one which is focused on the application of force by hinging on military security. Now, this in part could be due to the fact that for centuries, men have continued to dominate the conduct of diplomacy and foreign relations in India. And as such, the traditional male-defined notion of security has remained gender-blind, ignoring the particular needs of women and other marginalized groups, revolving around hard security issues and ignoring matters that are pertinent to soft security issues. Women, in fact, have been traditionally kept out of the sphere of international politics on the basis that a typical female approach would be more inclined towards soft security issues, such as human security, trafficking, migration, violence, etc., thus detracting attention from more important hard security issues. And owing to these socially constructed dichotomies, the sphere of diplomacy 
security and politics have been reserved for men where women or soft security issues have limited or no space now it is only in the past few decades that india's foreign policy approach has started moving towards non traditional security issues but even then the persistent marginalization of women from india's security apparatuses and otherwise have continued to make india's approach deeply gendered where power aggression and domination take priority over the goals of women empowerment and human security women in fact also continue to be underrepresented in uh, decision making positions within india's diplomatic mechanisms uh, for example out of 33 appointees so far for the position of india's foreign secretary only 3 have been women as of october 2020 the strength of ifs cadre stood at 815 with 176 female officers and as of june 2020 india had a total of 125 high commissions and embassies abroad but only 23 of them were female headed even in terms of policy making gender mainstreaming efforts have largely been observed uh, in india's foreign policy under the development assistance paradigm where programs are designed to make women engines for inclusive growth but can you really call this empowering women while some might argue that this is a step in the right direction for women empowerment the truth is that it does so only partially this is because this approach simply relegates women to certain roles instead of providing them with a platform to attain equal rights and thus leaves them with a limited choice now in light of these challenges it is important that india pursues reforms not only at the organizational level but also in terms of policy making in order to achieve more comprehensive and inclusive outcomes and the best way to do this is by the adoption of a ffp ffp framework so a ffp approach will provide stepping stones for india to pursue the goals of common well being equality and peace it is essentially based on three central principles of feminist perspectives on diplomacy and security which include broadening the conceptualization of security decoding international power structures and acknowledging women's agency in this sense it is an effort to move beyond the traditional notions of peace security and war that are prevalent in india to include other dimensions of uh, foreign policy such as environment health climate etc and by doing so india will begin looking at security in a more holistic way and incorporate the effects of its policies on women and other marginalized groups but while india has already begun moving towards soft security issues adoption of a ffp framework would therefore allow india to place its existing efforts in a better position to fulfill its global power ambition by prioritizing human as well as gender security issues taking such an approach will in fact allow india to emerge as a good member of the international community one that is concerned about variegated issues perform better in the global indicators and indexes that are designed to assess the overall development of a country and set an example by rigorously working towards women empowerment human security and gender issues adopting a ffp framework could also provide india with an important starting point to bring about an internal shift in its domestic context especially in terms of the strictly defined gender roles that continue to subjugate women to men and as we all know existing evidence constantly points towards the fact that gender equality is an important prerequisite for the economic and social development of a nation the strengthening of democratic institutions and the advancement of national security and by eliminating the existing gender barriers that restrict the voices of women and other groups the ffp will therefore provide a platform to ensure more inclusive policy outcomes and diverse representation a ffp approach could also provide a major boon to india's international relations by indicating a deeper commitment towards the goal of uh, women empowerment for instance it could help in building stronger long term ties with countries that have already adopted such a framework like canada sweden france mexico etc or even those those countries that have might not yet adopted the framework but are strong advocates of bringing about equality and considering that ffp is an all inclusive approach it could also assist india 
in fostering ties with countries by engaging with civil society organizations that ha already have a strong human rights standing in those countries. To sum up, FFP is a way for India not only to deepen its commitment towards equality, but also to make its presence felt as an emerging power. Now, India's past efforts signal that it is ready for such a change. India was the first country to send an all-female police unit to Liberia as early as 2007. As already mentioned before, India has been actively participating in the UNSC open debates on the WPS agenda and has strongly advocated for increasing women's participation in peacekeeping and peace building. These efforts clearly demonstrate that despite the prevailing gender gaps within India's domestic context, India has aligned, at least in some ways, if not completely, with the global normative framework on the WPS agenda. Therefore, India can move towards uh, adopting a feminist foreign policy framework by actively appointing women at various policy levels and involving them directly in the conduct of its foreign relations. Now, it can do so by uh, either placing a quota, uh, quota system or just by ensuring that there is an equal representation of men, women and other diverse groups. India can also collaborate with various international, regional and national civil society organizations to ensure the adoption as well as proper implementation of the FFP framework. A word of caution, the solution here is not to simply add and stir women but to provide qualitative and meaningful representation to women and other groupings, irrespective of their class, caste and religion. But the most important question, will India actually adopt such a feminist foreign policy framework? The truth is that uh, with India's historical trajectory being full of stories regarding women's subjugation, adoption of a FFP framework seems rather too optimistic for now. Patriarchal values are so deeply ingrained within the Indian society that India has been barely been able to bring about a change in the system of inequity at home. And thus, how can one expect India to embrace such strong feminist values in its global interaction? But nonetheless, the truth as it stands, a FFP approach is a significant tool that could help India in fostering innovative ways of thinking, allow it to build upon its traditional view of security, facilitate diverse representation and build long-term relations. It is therefore extremely important to continue to have these discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Akasha. And uh, Akasha was the millennial voice on our panel. So uh, I think we need to pay careful attention to all that she said. Uh, the value of inclusion, putting human security at the heart of all our policy making, looking at security in a more holistic way. She was uh, uh, perhaps uh, a little guarded in her conclusion about whether India can have a feminist foreign policy, but uh, there is certainly hope. And listening to the other speakers on our panel today, you realize, as uh, Jawaharlal Nehru said so long ago, India's soul is feminine. Uh, you know, as a country, we see our soul as feminine. So I think that has its impact in policy making, even if perhaps we we do not articulate it always in that form. But certainly the underlying precepts and the concepts are there and provide hope for the future. We have, don't have much time left uh, for in our webinar. I think we have to finish in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, so, so I shall go straight to the questions from our attendees. Uh, the first uh, question that we have here, anyone in the panel is free to, uh, to try answering it. Uh, how can a feminist foreign policy make a significant positive impact, I presume, here in our region, especially in deeply patriarchal communities um, similar to what we see in South Asia, and this is the quote from the question, where countries are driven more by guns and weapons. Would any of you like to answer that, any of our panel? Can I, I, can I ask Swarna? Swarna, yes, please. I'll just make a quick attempt. I think that it's sort of a, a 
a horse before cart, cart before horse question because I don't think it's the job of foreign policy to make an impact on uh, our deeply militarized and patriarchal societies. Rather, I think the impact works in the other direction and therefore if we want to transform our policies to be more feminist, more gender sensitive, uh, more compassionate, whatever adjective you want to put, I think that will have to come from changing the way we relate to each other and the culture of our public interactions. That's my short answer. Okay, I think that, that would make a lot of sense. Uh, this is a question maybe that uh, Bindu Lakshmi could try. It's a question from Urvashi Sharma. Uh, a number of Bangladeshi women work as domestic help in various parts of India. It gives them some sort of autonomy and economic security. How would a gender sensitive policy reconcile national security and the larger idea of women's emancipation in this scenario? I hope I will be able to, uh, I'll try to answer that. As I already said, uh, what I wonder when we talk about uh, cross-border migration, when we talk about, uh, you know, and this rhetoric is there in India very much there, you know, there is uh, seeing the Bangladeshi migrants as the other illegal, the national you know, threat to the nation's security. When, when, how do we change that imagination? Particularly if you try to look at the border crossing, if you try to look at the border, borders are highly, highly militarized. Militarized in the sense that no, it is coming from a particular ideology within which we built on that uh, borders. So, uh, isn't it necessary to you know reimagine the idea of security differently? Isn't it necessary to see then the articulation of autonomy which comes from women's mobility? No, then they have a right to move, and it is uh, you know how do we facilitate? a sensitive you know, articulation of that mobility. More than that, uh, for me as an you know, academic, uh, I would try to take it as methodologically. The moment we th talk about uh, migration, the moment we th talk about border crossing, we immediately try to put in state boundaries. And we are very strictly you know, with that methodological nationalism. And it's time to think of, and that is why when we are talking about transnationalism, that makes much sense. How do we then, in the feminist articulation of transnationalism, it is beyond state border. And this note, we cannot keep, keep the state border as uh, trying to talk about these stories of migration. And we would really navigate if you, and I, I'm sure people who are working on uh, Assam Bangladesh border would see that the histories of migration, histories of you know, mobility across border, we cannot you know, put it as India and Bangladeshi migrants separately. It is built on relationship. It is built on different stories of, uh, there are stories of, you know, one can say smuggling, one can say, stories of different kind, there are different things which comes in. So how do we then go beyond this articulation of the strict regime of nationalism to talk about uh, the articulation of migration? I hope uh, uh, maybe uh, we can have more conversation. Uh, yeah, I think that's an important point. How do we go beyond strict regimes of nationalism to have a more integrative approach to some of these issues concerning women and uh, their livelihoods and their aspirations, can the I, scope can of I their just, desires. Can I just add one thing? I'm sorry if I'm not taking um, much time. Yeah. So this is like a one woman again. I know this like a number of stories I had with me. So this one woman whom I met and uh, I was, uh, you know, having, I have collected her life stories. I came back and she's, uh, you know, she's from this uh, southern state of Kerala and I decided to go and meet her mother and I was with her mother, that's the time I'm getting a call from her and she's saying that she's waiting to get an exit pass, this is amnesty declared and she said her name is not there because in the document it says that she's already left the country and she's there in Dubai because there is this uh, regime of somebody has confiscated her passport, the passport has traveled without her and we know that, how does it happen because there are different regimes and here is a woman who has to then now prove and she doesn't have her passport with her and uh, the document yeah. she says that she, so how, how, do we, yeah. how do we talk about the nation state, how do we talk about you know, uh, migration in that context? When the, there are multiple stories emerging. Absolutely. And women's rights are human rights, as you say. Let me come to one question that has come uh, to us via WhatsApp. 
And maybe, uh, Samita, you may like to tackle this question. As one speaker rightly pointed out about certain Western countries promoting feminist norms uh, on the one hand and high arms exports on the other, are there any radical progressive narratives of feminist foreign policy that can emerge from the non-Western states? Would you like to tackle that, Samita? Sure. I mean, that's a pretty broad uh, question. Uh, but um, um, what I would say is that even with my critique of the of specifically in that case, uh, uh, Canada and Sweden, we need to keep in mind the the contradictory aspects of these policies. I mean, they are also these countries are also promoting uh, uh, issues relating to women's rights. They are also giving money for this. So um, I'm, I'm critiquing these countries, but also point, you know, this is not to say that they, are, they have not done important work. Now, as far as, you know, the, the, uh, the non-Western ideas, uh, 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 possible policy contributions are concerned, um, I think there was a related question in the chat box as well with regard to kind of making feminist fa foreign policy functional. And so I was thinking of uh, India's policy towards Afghanistan. And if in India was to adopt a gender sensitive foreign policy with regard to Afghanistan, what might that look like? Um, and, and in fact, what came to mind is also the uh, uh, India often doesn't often mention uh, other countries in its uh, statements at the Security Council at these thematic debates on WPS and Afghanistan is the only country from the region that comes up when, you know, with regard to policy implementation. And in that respect, it could be as uh, as um, concrete as ensuring that uh, uh, that women take part in the peace negotiations. We know that there was so much uh, you know, there was there was so much conversation on the fact that there were very few women in the intra afghan uh, uh, dialogue. Uh, and so taking a stand there, promoting participation of women or when India provides uh, aid, development aid to Afghanistan, making sure that there is gender budgeting there, that there is, you know, when those say if there's infrastructure, then it takes into account gender sensitive aspects of that infrastructure development. So I'm not uh, I'm not here talking about a Western versus non Western idea, but really just giving concrete examples of what India might want to do in this respect. Thank you. Thank you. I see that Swati is back with us because I think she had dropped off because of Internet problems, but she's back with us. Uh, Swati, would you like to add to uh, that uh, those comments that Samita just made. Uh, I wonder if you heard the question. Yes, I did. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Would you like I to did. Thank that? you. Yes, very quickly, because I know we don't have much time. I think it's important to not also, while I still stand by my critique of both WPS and uh, FFP, now oh. we have even uh, legitimized oh. the acronym. I, I still think that the, it doesn't help to just strictly consider it as a binary thing, that there is something called non-West and West. You know, we are operating in a different space on that. We need to be vigilant and constantly scrutinize. But I wanted to tie up everything to this. What can we effectively do to change patriarchal cultures, right? So I agree with you, Swarna, that we can't, foreign policy is not expected to do. But I just had a tiny example from Australia where I spent a number of years. They decided at one point of time that they are going to make violence against women a, pre a national security priority, right? A lot of critique emerged and people were concerned about how security, you know, women's security would be kind of securitized for national interest. But I think it's a very successful model of how they do it, how they did it. And it was a conservative, liberal, uh, nationalist party in power. Even then, they invested hundreds and thousands of dollars to say that we have a problem. We have a problem, not out there. Australia has a problem. And they dealt with it so well. I mean, raising awareness, you know, uh, doing data collection, because data is also a big issue, and setting up advocacy centers, providing help to women, including migrant women who were facing this problem. Uh, and then, of course, Australia then takes the leadership. Universities began to work on WPS agenda and so on and so forth. I just think that I, I really think that's a good model to tie up. I mean, one of the things we're also saying here is that the domestic is international 
national is national is international, right? We are making those connections and feminist uh, ideas of foreign policy. And that is where we, I mean, patriarchal cultures will not change because we have a foreign policy top down. It will change because we link the everyday issues to what is happening uh, and how the state behaves. And as I already indicated that we have some hope given the long genealogy of really looking at uh, power and peace as uh, as uh, as uh, differently than than most states would would so i think that that pretty much that thank you thank you for that yeah thank you uh, i think uh, you know one of the takeaways as i can see it from this uh, discussion today is how we link the national and international Secondly, how we provide a more holistic definition to foreign policy and our definitions of security to include the human dimension. And uh, thirdly, and this is a question that I'd like to ask uh, each of our panelists to answer just in under a minute, if you can, please. If there was one step that you deem necessary for the creation of a gender sensitive foreign policy for India, what would you define that step to be? And I'd like to begin with Swarna. I think actually gender sensitization training for uh, our highest executive offices, the people who make the decisions, and then that trickles down to a practice of uh, training. That's Thank my you. one under one minute answer. Thank you. I think based on uh, my work on this, I would uh, uh, I would suggest a greater engagement with existing international norms on um, on relating to gender and um, to to uh, have an Indian perspective on that uh, and really seriously engage with existing policies that that are there. Thank you. Thank you, Swati. Yes, there was a critique from one gentleman on this panel in social media saying that how do you expect gender to discuss gender equality when you have a panel of all women? Mind you, there are not many panels where all women are there, right? But anyways, to challenge uh, that comment and several others, just to point out that we have too many manals, too many men. And if we are not paying attention to, you know, having women in our foreign services and our decision making bodies, uh, we have to make more noise about it, I would say, you know, irrespective of where we are and what we do. So having more women, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I think we need to howl at the moment. Uh, Lakshmi. Uh, I would say, you know, we have to have, uh, you know, we have to reimagine our stakeholders in uh, foreign policy. That is to come from a standpoint of the most marginalized. And I'm taking a feminist standpoint here to say that the standpoint from the most marginalized, wherever way, then gender is not the only entity. There are multiple intersections. Yes, and, and I'm taking an intersectional feminist perspective now to talk about imagining foreign policy. Thank you. And Akansha? Um, for me, it would be making space, uh, making space not only in terms of participation and inclusion, but also really providing a space where, you know, diverse groups uh, can be represented and can raise their voices. As uh, Swati said, that only when you make the noise, the change will start to happen. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we're drawing to the close of this fascinating discussion. I wish we could have had a little more time. But uh, there will be future opportunities, I'm sure. Can I turn it over to Ankita to propose the vote of thanks? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, with this, we come to an end to a very fascinating discussion. And I take this opportunity to thank our chair, our panelists, and all the participants for their time and their attention. Thank you. And we look forward to all of you joining us for our upcoming events. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.